Today we're going to look at the topic of when it was said to Peter that when thou art converted. Recently we seen a, a very lengthy comment that is trying to explain away Peter's uh, failure in forsaking the Lord to the fact that he had not yet received the Holy Spirit. So this verse came up as a proof text to say that Peter had failed because he had not yet received the Holy Spirit and and it, it they the people that sent it imply that a believer cannot apostatize forsake the Lord offend that's what offend means that you've stumbled you're not walking uprightly and since it was a lengthy email I can't address everything in it or a lengthy comment but we're going to pick apart this one idea what does the word convert mean converted now i know in in modern usage it is speaking of the time when a person has uh been changed from an unbeliever to a believer speaking of their conversion but as we use the the king james it's not used in the sense that the religious lingo uses it today and i want to show you by taking you Firstly, to the Old Testament, to the law first mentioned where the word converted in English is actually translated that way. And then we'll go from there. In Psalm 51, we're receiving a Holy Spirit inspired psalm from King David. And it's speaking of the time when following David's sin, when he had gone into Bathsheba, and most of you know the, the following events that happened after that, that he uh, had actually orchestrated a murder to try and cover it up. And Psalm 51.1 says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me throughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desires truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken May rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltness, O God, thy God, thou God of my salvation. And my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou de desirest not sacrifice else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. In these passages, we have King David, a child of God, the anointed king of Israel, who had sinned and broken his fellowship with God. He had tried to hide his sin. 
he had not acknowledged his sins to God and his fellowship was broken. And in the life of a believer, that is essential to understand that our penalty from hell has been paid when we've trusted Christ. But our fellowship is a personal relationship of confessing our sins to God, learning his ways, going to him when we sin. Because when we don't, we can't feel his presence. We are walking in darkness at that point. Though the truth of our salvation exists contractually and on, based on the promises of God, we can't feel him. We can't have that intimate relationship that our sin wedges between us and our Heavenly Father. And David is showing how the road to restoration of fellowship took place here. And afterwards, when David had got the beam out of his own eye, he can go on to teach the ways of God. And here, the word converted, it's the first time it's used. It's H7725. The Hebrew word there would be shub. It's not the first time shub is used in scripture, but the first time converted is used in the English language. And we'll go on to look at another usage of it that predates this one, where it's translated into a different word. But I do want to point out in 1 John 1, this is speaking to believers about how to restore the fellowship between them and God as we sin. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. And it's not talking about your eternal destiny, but your walk in fellowship with God. First John 1 8, written to believers, say that if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, you remember when David said, I acknowledge my sins? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. The book of 1 John, one of the reasons that it was written was so that you can have a full, joyful walk with God, how to have a proper fellowship with God. Chapter 1, verse 4 says, And these things write unto you, that's believers, that your joy may be full. As referenced in the psalm, what was one of the aspects that David was feeling? He had no joy. His sin had separated him from the joy associated with God's salvation. He didn't feel God in his presence. And we as believers, any of us who have walked with the Lord any length of time, we know exactly what David's talking about, that our sin as we're walking in the flesh separates us from that joy, separates us from God's very presence. His presence is there. We just can't feel it. So converted here in its first usage is speaking of converting sinners after David himself had dealt with sin. And we are all sinners throughout the world. You just have saved sinners and unsaved sinners. But while we're in this flesh, we have the tendency and the likelihood and the ability to walk in the old man and sin. And one of the consequences of that is a broken fellowship with your Heavenly Father. So as sinners, saved sinners, how do we restore that broken fellowship? We convert, we return, we come back to our Heavenly Father and we confess our sins. Because we're walking with God and our sin separates us in our fellowship, so we have to come back. We draw nigh to Him, and the Bible says what? To believers. He will draw nigh to us. 
you're returning, you're converting, reverting. So H7725 Shub simply in its root form means to turn back, hence away. It's a turning. The way a lot of people nowadays use, you know, repent as you're turning to God. You're coming back to God. If you're a unsaved person, you are turning to God for your salvation for the first time. If you are a believer that is walking in the flesh carnally, you're turning back to the light of God and his word. The first use of Shub in scripture we find all the way back in Genesis. And it's in Genesis 3, right after the fall. It says, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return, Shub, be converted, return, unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and into dust thou shalt return. So you came from the dust, and you're going back to the dust. That's Shub, that's the idea. You're going back to the original starting point. And understanding, and that's the Old Testament, and you can search all this out for yourself, and I recommend that you do, all the different ways that Shub is translated in the Old Testament, sometimes convert, return, and so forth. There's over a thousand uses you know, usage of that word. So I couldn't obviously put them all on here. But check everything that I say. Go back and check behind me to make sure I didn't make a, a clerical error or a mistake. That's exactly what you should do. Now in Acts 3, we'll jump into the New Testament before we get in to the book of Luke. The uh, topic for today is coming from Luke. And this is Peter speaking to a Jewish audience, a Jewish audience that has turned from God. That's important to understand in Scripture who the audience is. In Acts 3, it says, And now, brethren, I wot or know that through your ignorance ye did it, ye, as did your rulers. So this is an audience-specific comment. But those things which God before hath showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. So Peter's speaking that the Old Testament gospel included the death of Christ. The gospel in regard to salvation has always been the same that the Messiah would come and pay for the sins of the world. Peter did not preach a different gospel. Repent ye, so there's your change of mind. Your, whatever you're believing and how you see things at this point, repent ye, and it's trying to get you to turn to a different view. Therefore, and be converted. There's... In Acts, you see, be converted, repent, turning to God. Be converted, you're turning back to God. This is Israel, that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, Jews. The Messiah came, you rejected him. Repent, change your mind, you're turning to Christ internally and be converted, you're turning back to God. You see that turn, repent, convert. This is an example of the parallelism to where similar or related and synonymous thoughts are packaged together. It's like a double statement, all in one. So converted here isn't speaking about when you are trusting Christ in the sense that when you get the Holy Ghost, but it's calling for a turning, a coming back to God. Israel had forsaken 
God. They had apostatized. They had tripped over the law. And they're being called to come back to God. Be converted. The word in Acts 3.19 for be converted is epistrepho. That's the Greek 1994 for those that want to do a word search and validate what I'm saying. Now, that's what the word is meaning to turn, revert, come or go again, convert, revert, turn about again. So often it's again, you're going back to the place you were before and where you need to be. Now, how does Luke, you know, that's from Acts, but I want to look how Luke himself uses the word because it's Luke that God is using to document his gospel. So we can look how you, Luke uses epistropho and how the King James translators, or translators translated it into English in other areas prior to getting to Luke 22, which is toward the end of the book. So, epistropho, to revert, literally or figuratively, morally, to come or go again, turn about again, convert or revert. In Luke 1, uh, 16, it's translated, shall he turn? Luke 1, 17, to turn. 22, or 2, verse 20, returned. Chapter 8, verse 55, came again, converted, came again. 17.4, turn again. 22.32, converted. Come again. When you return, when you come back. That's what the word converted is being used as in Luke. And we see that pattern of how Luke is using the word epistrepho or converted to turn, return, it's not about in any way is it is this being linked in and of itself to any event in the future by which when the Holy Spirit would be given. This is a standalone event. And far too often in Christianity do people conflate terms to all mean the same thing. And conflate means you just blend it all together and squish it to mean the same thing, like uh, recently the comment was made that to be a believer is automatically to be a disciple and it's all umbrellaed as one and the same thing. No, no it's not. They're completely and utterly separate things and we don't need to blend or mix them. So what I'm hoping to do is help unpack some of the, the blending of the idea of when it says that when thou art converted, that this somehow is automatically tied to Pentecost or tied to when Jesus breathed on the disciples and they received the Holy Spirit. This is a unique and particular event and it's actually a fulfillment of prophecy. Many will look down on Peter for what happened. But this event isn't to dog Peter or throw Peter under the bus. For one, it's a reality that any Christian can forsake the Lord in his walk, in his prayer life, any of those things. And when you peel off the lordship, salvation, doctrine of perseverance of the saints that these lordship ministries have, have uh, adopted that a believer will do or won't do this, that, or the other, the reality can 
help you prevent tripping over obstacles because you know to look for them. And in Luke 22, Jesus foretells of Peter's de denial, that he would deny him. And then we're going to look at some parallel accounts of the event that have more detail than Luke does. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, that's, that's Peter. Behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Now, it's important to have a King James because the you there is plural. This isn't just about Peter. The conversation is to Peter. The topic of who Satan is wanting to, to sift his wheat is all the disciples, you. And then while speaking to Peter, it said, I have prayed for thee, singular, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen who? Thy brethren. This is a statement made from our Lord to a saved believer, Peter, about something that's preparing to happen, that is future tense going to happen. And there's actually multiple things being said here. It for, is foretelling of Peter's denial, but it's also promising and assuring Peter that he would return, that he would come back, because the Lord didn't say, if thou art converted, if thou come back. He says, when? Strengthen thy brethren. And then Peter, like many of us, he doesn't think he can fail. He doesn't think he's going to stumble. He, he is convinced he, would, he will not forsake the Lord. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. And at this point, Peter is bold and he's convinced he will not offend. He is convinced that he will not fail the Lord or forsake the Lord. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. So Peter's convinced, I'm not going to offend. This isn't going to happen. I'm not going to stumble. I'm not going to forsake you. I'm ready to die for you. Jesus is telling him, yes, you will deny me. Yes, you will be offended, which means stumble, forsaken. But he's also assuring him, when thou art converted, when thou have returned, when thou art come back, strengthen thy brethren. Now Mark and Matthew give us a lot more detail about what's going on in this event. In Mark 14, 26, it says, And when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. And Jesus saith unto them, and to them, this is the disciples, the believers, all ye, all ye shall be offended because of me this night. All ye will stumble. All ye will forsake me this night. I'm not sure if a lot of people have caught this, but this is a prophecy that is being fulfilled. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep, who's the sheep, shall be scattered. But after that, I am risen. I will, I will go before you into Galilee. So there's this sandwiching of, we actually say a song, then the bad news, and then it's sandwiched in between some more good news. It's kind of that method that people use where you give somebody good news then bad news, and then sandwich it with another layer of good news being used here. But Jesus is promising them, you will be scattered. And there's an example of that parallelism again. Offended, 
scattered. They're with the shepherd. They're forsaking the shepherd. But Peter said unto him, Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. Now when Jesus says all, he means all. And I know Peter, this is a passionate plea that a passionate plea that he will not fail. But Jesus said, all of you will be offended. All of you will forsake me. Peter declares, no. All doesn't mean all. All means everybody but me. When Jesus said unto him, back to Mark uh, 1430, and Jesus said, saith unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Peter, that this day, even in this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter replies, because you know he's always obedient. No, he wasn't. He meant well, but he wasn't always obedient. But he spake the more vehemently, if I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise or any way. Likewise, also said they all. So Peter's vehement, you know, proclamation that, no, I know that you told us that there's a scripture that said, well, I'll forsake you, but I'm not going to. And his mannerisms carried on to who? Everyone else. Likewise, also said they all. They all declared, nope, not me. Not going to happen. We're ready to die for you. Mark 14, 50 says, and they all forsook him and fled. What happened there? The prophecy that Jesus stated, for it is written, the sheep shall be scattered was fulfilled just like he said each and every one now mark fourteen sixty six through 72 we'll go on and break down the details of peter denying the lord after they all offended after they all for, forsook him when christ was arrested just like jesus said but Jesus made him a promise. This is going to happen, but when thou art converted, when you have returned, strengthen thy brethren. Jesus didn't leave him without encouragement. Matthew 26, 30 also foretells of Peter's denial and his return, his conversion, his coming back. That this would happen it says and when they had sung in him they went out into the mount of olives then saith jesus unto them all ye shall be offended because of me this night why i mean you know but the importance of prophecy fulfillment is crucial in understanding the bible what god promises will happen will happen period no exception. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. Whose sheep is being scattered here? Jesus' sheep. But after I am risen again, speaking of his death and his resurrection there, yet again, I will go before you. Who's the you? The sheep that have forsaken him. I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, To all men shall be offended, because of thee yet will I never be offended. I will never be in a state of being by which I have forsaken you. Be offended. I won't stumble. I'll walk upright. I'll follow you to death. I'll follow you to prison. No, that's not what played out 
Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. All the disciples said one thing. Jesus said that all would be offended. All would stumble and forsake him. And again, when Jesus says all, he means all. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. There's the way the Bible starts making it clear and how it defines itself. Offended, forsaking. It's the disciples apostatized and forsook the Lord. But he was faithful. He didn't forsake them. Converted, epistrapho in this telling of Peter's conversion, when thou art converted, isn't speaking about the futuristic time in which he would receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. In its usage, in its context, in the way Luke uses the word in his gospel, it is speaking just like we see in the, the accounts of the prophetic event that they would forsake him in that there would be a failure, and yes, Peter would deny the Lord, but also that when he would return, that when he would come back and turn back to God again, say he was already there, he forsook and had to come back. When he was converted, he was to strengthen the brethren, the other believers. Converted in how it's used in the prophecy fulfillment of the disciples forsaking the Lord is not speaking of that future time when the Holy Spirit would be given. It's just not, not in the context, not in the way the word is being used within the book. But when Peter would, that is also a prophetic statement from Jesus, that Peter would return, that Peter would be converted revert, come back again after he had forsook Jesus, the bishop and the shepherd of our souls. So if the Lordship people are trying to use this verse to build a platform that Peter only failed because he had not yet received the Holy Spirit, they're misusing this verse. That is not what's being said here. Not at all. So do, you know, back up and research everything that I've showed you. Look at all the other usage of, of the word of epistrepho in the New Testament. Look in Luke, then expound out the rest of the scripture and see how the King James translators translated that word turn, turn about, and so forth. And you'll see that religion yet again has took a word and a more modern understanding of conversion and kind of layered that idea over the text when that's not what the, the text is actually saying to us. And I tried to keep this one kind of short. And if there's any questions, you know, maybe put it in the comments. And if I need to, I can touch this back up later or add more detail if it wasn't clear enough. And, you know, Understand the importance of studying the scripture itself and pulling the meaning from the scripture and not from theology or systematic theology or ideas to where you're laying ideas on the text instead of having the text and the context. What's being described 
coming out and showing you what it is is being saying. So when Peter was converted or had returned back to the Lord, he was to strengthen the, the brethren, and he did. He didn't walk perfectly before or after receiving the Holy Ghost. We see a progressive maturity in Peter in the end by the time we get his letters, but the Bible doesn't paint us as perfectly sinless, holier than thou people. Christ came and died for sinners because we could not live the life perfectly that we needed to and we missed the mark continually. The Holy Spirit will empower you to not sin. Absolutely. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. Absolutely. The ho same Holy Spirit that you can grieve because of your sin. The same Holy Spirit that you can quench and ignore if you choose to walk in your flesh. And there's consequences that come if you ignore the leading of the Holy Spirit. If you ignore the scriptures and if you choose to walk in your flesh you have broken fellowship to where you won't be able to feel that intimate closeness with god because you've chosen your sin over obedience to god's word and spirit you can face chastisement you can lose blessings you can miss out on the life that god wants to lead you through in this fallen world if you choose to walk in the flesh and in disobedience so if you find yourself in a position that you have walked away from God that you have chosen to walk in your flesh there's a simple fix humble yourself turn to your Heavenly Father be converted be turned back around and facing him. As John says and David did in, in Psalm 51, confess your sins to your heavenly father. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is faithful to his word and he wants his children to seek him daily. And hopefully this helps and peels at least one more layer of the endless layers of lordship, salvation, sinless perfection. The idea out of people's minds and maybe even prompted you to see something in scripture that I didn't see and just dig into the meat of the word and just love and bask in the glory of God's word and what all it offers us, which is endless truth and, and it is alive and it's powerful. And I pray that God can use you and me and all in some mighty way and help us to walk in close fellowship with him so that we don't have to be converted and turned back again, that we'll just stay as close as we can to him, letting him lead us in all that we do. And with that, I want to say God bless you and take care until next time.